of the Bible reading today uh, comes from Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 to 17. Uh, We're reading from the Christian Standard Bible, which is the pew Bible we have uh, in our church building here in town. Uh, You'll find a copy of the Bible reading on the screen in front of you or in the service sheets if you've printed them off, or you can follow along in the Bibles that you have at home. Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 to 17. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he got up and followed him. While he was reclining at the table in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came as guests to eat with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, those who are well don't need a doctor but the sick do, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. Then John's disciples came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests be sad while the groom is with them? The days will come when the groom will be taken away from them, and then they'll fast. No one patches an old garment with untrunk cloth, because the patch pulls away from the garment and makes the tear worse. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise the skins burst, the wine spills out, and the skins are ruined. But they put new wine into fresh wineskins, and both are preserved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I've got a sermon outline there on the screen. It'll be hard for you to take notes on the screen. And so if you've printed it off, you can take notes there in the sermon outline uh, in your service sheets. Uh, you'll notice down the bottom uh, of this page, uh, there is a comments box. Uh, you can post any comments about the service, any feedback, uh, any queries or questions that the passage raises in that box. And Neil and I will try to answer those questions as soon as we can. Donna Leone uh, is one of my favourite detective authors. Uh, She's an American who's based now in Switzerland. Uh, Her focus is the city of Venice. Her key character is Commissario Guido Brunetti. He's a genuinely lovely kind of bloke. He's married to Paola and they have two terrific kids. Uh, I highly recommend her writing and her books. I reckon they are some of the most brilliant books for their general insight into human nature and the way society works. Her first Brunetti novel was released nearly 30 years ago, A Death at La Fenicia. A La Fenicia, I think I'm saying that correctly, but if you know that I'm not, please uh, send me a note in that box. A La Fenicia is the great opera venue in Venice uh, at An interval in a key production, the conductor, a world-renowned but not well-liked man, is poisoned by cyanide. Uh, As everyone comes back in to sit down after the interval, uh, whispers start to move through the opera hall, which is unusual in itself as people wait. And finally, the manager of the production stands on the stage and asks, is there a doctor in the house? In one sense, it becomes a metaphor for not only the first novel in the Brunetti series, but for the city of Venice itself. As you follow Donna Leone's writings, that city becomes increasingly dark and corrupt, decaying at every level, physically broken, damaged socially, economically, politically and morally. Uh, It's actually a stock standard line in many movies and novels, isn't it? Is there a doctor in the house? But that doesn't lessen the effect of the metaphor. There is sickness afoot, and what is needed is the doctor. We live in a world that is obviously sick at this moment. The COVID-19 pandemic has created a sickly kind of pallor or colour over the world. We've always sensed this sickliness. Sometimes we've experienced it in its sharpness, but now it is so obvious. 
In all honesty, as I've said a number of times in sermons, I've never met anyone who said that this world is as good as it gets or has ever said, I'm, I'm perfect, I'm not broken. Everyone knows and feels that this world is broken in some sense. And I think that we experience this in a slightly sharper way in this neck of the woods, in the bush, don't we? We experience this sickness not just through pandemics, but because we live in times of drought and fire. We live on farms and in towns where nothing can really be hidden and the brokenness is quite obvious. This world needs healing. Humans, as the central figures of this world, need healing. Put simply, we need a doctor. Is there a doctor in the house? Let me pray, and we're going to meet the doctor. Dear God, thank you for your word. Thank you that we can read it. Thank you that from little children to elderly adults, your word applies to every human being because it is the revelation of yourself whose image we bear. Father, thank you that as we open your word this morning, we meet the doctor who's come to deal with our illness. Father, help us to listen to the doctor and to submit to his care. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus is at work. Uh, That seems to be the theme of this chunk of Matthew's Gospel, the good news about Jesus. Uh, It's bookended by Matthew 4.23 and Matthew 9.35. This section starts and ends with Jesus preaching and teaching and healing. From the Sermon on the Mount, where we see the authority of Jesus as the preacher-teacher, through to the series of miracles organised in sets of three, showing Jesus as the saviour and the healer and God, interspersed with chunks on what it means to follow Jesus, showing Jesus as the Lord. This whole section is about Jesus at work and it closes in chapters 11 through 12 with his second big chunk of teaching. Throughout, Matthew wants us to meet Jesus as he truly is, to see the nature of Jesus. And as Matthew presents the nature of Jesus, he wants to gauge our reaction. He wants us to look at our reactions to who Jesus is, how we deal with him. We meet Jesus as he is, the teacher, the preacher, the saviour, the healer, Lord, God. We come face to face with the one God promised from the family of Abraham who would come to roll back the curse of sin and replace it with God's approval. We come face to face with the one that God promised would come from the family of David, that great family of kings who would rule the world as God intended. And Matthew wants us to meet him as he is, to watch him at work, and then to work out what we're going to do with him. I have point two on the outline. Uh, Jesus is back in Capernaum. Uh, It's his home base, if you like, of so much of his work. Uh, In three short, sharp miracles, remember we looked at them last week. Remember that Matthew's organised this section around three miracles, a section on teaching about following Jesus, three miracles, a section on teaching about following Jesus, three miracles, and then a large chunk of teaching. In those three short, sharp miracles we looked at last week, he's shown his authority to set the natural right, to set the supernatural right, to set a whole human being right. He's been revealed as God in the flesh. And as Jesus moves about his home base, about the town of Capernaum, he meets Matthew. Look at verse 9. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office and he said to him, follow me. So he got up and followed him. Matthew's sitting at the tax office. Already when we hear that phrase, we know our natural hostility towards taxes, paying them, the tax office. That's nothing compared to how tax collectors were perceived around the streets of Capernaum in Israel. They were a symbol of invasion and oppression. They were the betrayers of the nation. They were people who worked as instruments of corruption and colonialism. They were participating in what was regarded as a fundamentally unclean and socially unacceptable occupation. They were outsiders on every level. They're also extremely wealthy, pragmatic, and ruthless. Matthew's sitting at the tax office. He's a tax collector. 
Jesus approaches him. Jesus commands him, follow me. Remember that historical present we talked about two weeks ago? How Matthew uses the language to bring ideas and words and actions to the forefront of his narrative? Well, this is one of those moments. Jesus commands. Matthew follows. Jesus commands very clear, isn't it? No grey area in those two words, follow me. Not ambiguous. To follow is to follow me. Not negotiable. Not open to interpretation. Doesn't have a series of dependent clauses and subclauses, appendices or conditions. No alternative routes or teachers or leaders. You're not given options. Jesus says, follow me. Remember what we talked about two weeks ago? Jesus defines what it means to follow him. He's the boss. He defines that. This is an example of Jesus defining what it means to follow him, but it's even more than that, as we'll see in a few moments. But Did you notice Jesus initiates everything here? Jesus initiates the call. Jesus finds Matthew. Jesus commands Matthew. Matthew responds. There's the template for following Jesus. Just as we learned two weeks ago, Jesus is Lord. He defines what it means to follow him. And when he says, follow me, you follow him. Matthew is a living, breathing example of that template. There's immediate joy here. We mustn't miss that. I'm at point three on the outline. Uh, Remember that Matthew himself is writing this account. The, The focus isn't on Matthew in one sense. The focus is on Jesus. But in the next few verses, we'll see what happens when a tax collector is made right inside and out. A tax collector, an outsider, an outcast. He becomes one of the key biographers of Jesus, one of only four gospel writers. He understands in and of himself the grand transformation that comes when Jesus says, follow me. And so he throws a banquet. Verse 10, while he was reclining at the table in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came as guests to eat with Jesus and his disciples. Again, the focus isn't on Matthew, is it? Matthew's made sure of that, but other gospel accounts are Luke, Luke chapter 5, verse 29, Mark, Mark chapter 2, 14 to 22, they give us some of the details. Matthew has followed Jesus. Matthew throws a banquet. It is a joyous affair. We're meant to get that. It's attended by people from Matthew's previous social classes. Many tax collectors and sinners came as guests to eat with Jesus. There is an unmistakable mood here of a feast of joy and delight and and just gathering together. We miss that, don't we? Matthew invites Jesus, presumably his disciples, to join in a meal with Matthew's other social network, the, the sinners. It's a joyous mixing of social networks. It's not hard to see that Matthew wants his other friends to meet Jesus and to be transformed just as he was. It's not hard to see that Matthew is a living, breathing example, just like the paralytic of a man set right inside and outside. What a wonderful meal that would have been. What a wonderful image of an outsider brought in, a man set right, saying, hey, guys, do you want to meet the bloke who made me right? And then having a dinner party so that this can take place. Well, just as at the Gadarenes, There are some who are not comfortable with Jesus being here. Look at verse 11. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? The Pharisees are puzzled. They're the religious leaders. I wouldn't go so far as to say they're the religious police, but they certainly have a reputation for being upright in their religious observance. And so they hear of what's going on. They see. They wouldn't have been invited, and even if they had, they wouldn't have attended because you don't mix with that social class. You don't mix with those people. You don't eat food with that group of people. 
They're puzzled. What's Jesus doing? Hanging out with sinners. Why is he at the dinner table with bad people? They're just certain people you associate with and certain people you don't. There's an A-list and the rest are sinners. What's Jesus doing? Well, the question's conveyed to Jesus and he replies. Look there in verses 12 to 13. But when he heard this, he said, those who are well don't need a doctor, but the sick do. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus makes an observation. In fact, he uses a a well-known phrase from the time. It's a truth we're familiar with. Sick people need a doctor. Healthy people don't need a doctor. Now, the Pharisees would have nodded their heads at this. After all, they would agree with such a truth and the connection Jesus is making is unavoidable. Of course the sinners need a doctor. They certainly don't need me to eat with them. Let me pause and just tease that idea out a little. Sin is the attitude and action that says, I am God and God is not. Let me say that again. Sin is the attitude and action that says, I am God, and God is not. It's the virus that broke the world. Remember our series on Genesis, which we kicked off last year, as we looked at Adam and Eve and the way in which their rebellion against God, where they said, I am God and God's not. Remember when that led to the global pandemic that has never ended? The global pandemic that has no vaccine developed in a human laboratory? The global pandemic that's passed on not by breathing but by DNA, by nature, into every generation, into every human being. The world is broken by sin. That's the pandemic. All humans are sick with sin. And Jesus is making this unavoidable connection. The sinful person needs help. They need a doctor. Jesus then gives a rebuke, doesn't he? He speaks directly to the Pharisees in the language of the schools that they know and have grown up in. He confronts their complete inability to know the God they say they represent. He quotes from Hosea. Hosea is an Old Testament messenger from God, a prophet who was speaking to God's people. And as he quotes from Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, He commands the Pharisees to examine the desire of God. I mean, if they claim to represent God, surely they know what God desires. A quote from Hosea is brutal in its exposure. Hosea was speaking to God's people who look good on the outside. They never missed a religious activity, but who were rotten in their hearts, abusive and selfish in their economics oppressive in their social relationships, brutal in their politics. Hosea had spoken to a people who'd created a performance-based religion, which they used to hide the state of their own hearts. God, the God they say they represent to the world, God's not like that at all. God knows the heart of every human being. And so God knows that no performance by a human will deal with the sickness of sin. It will just express it. God's desire was not for performance but for mercy, giving to sinners what they could not, would not earn, deserve or achieve. That's how God has always operated. Remember his action in the face of Adam and Eve's rebellion? Remember the way he dealt with creation when he saw that every inclination of the human heart was evil? And Noah, remember the way he sought Abraham at the moment that Abraham was actively turning away from God. Remember the way he dealt with David. God has committed himself to dealing with sin for humans through the family of Abraham. God's default, God's baseline, as Andrew Cameron reminded us earlier this year, is mercy Mercy to humans who deserve no mercy. And God's people were meant to represent that to the world, to know this desire themselves so that they could show the character of God to the world and the world would come back to God. These religious leaders didn't know God. 
These religious leaders didn't desire mercy. These religious leaders loved their key performance indicators. These religious leaders completely isolated, cut off, cast out, ostracized anyone who wasn't good enough for them. And so Jesus draws a conclusion as the one Matthew has clearly identified as the one promised by God to do with sin in the world. Remember Matthew 1 verse 1? Jesus confirms this truth. I've come to deal with sinners. Jesus is the culmination of the promise of God, the desire of God, that mercy be extended to sinners. Now, that conclusion... We can glance back at Matthew and put two and three together, can't we? Matthew was a sinner. Jesus had come to deal with him, to call him. Jesus did deal with him and call him. Matthew was set aright again, inside and out. The doctor had made a house call. And Matthew was made one of God's people. But Jesus' words have a sting in them. A sting that we hope the religious leaders hear. You see, if you read Hosea 6 carefully from where Jesus quoted, it's a little earlier on in your service sheets. The key truth that condemns these men, as it did with their ancestors, was that they did not know God as he is. That meant they didn't know themselves. That meant that they didn't know their need and they couldn't display God to the world in a tragic way. This meant that they were the very people they rejected as unworthy. They were sinners in not knowing God, in choosing to replace God with themselves and all their key religious performances, they showed that they were sick, that they were sinners, that they needed Jesus just as much as the tax collectors. In truth, I think Jesus is saying very clearly in these three statements that he's come to deal with all people because all people are sinners, tax collectors and the religiously active. If you are a human being, you are a sinner. If you are a human being, you have the virus of sin in your nature. If you are a human being, you've been struck down by this pandemic. If you are a human being, You need Jesus, the doctor who has come to deal with sin. Now, before we go any further, I want us just to pause there to make sure that we've grasped who Jesus is and what that means for us. Jesus is the one promised by God who would come to deal with the basic human problem of sin. Jesus is the one God promised who would come to deal with the broken state of our world, with the broken state of our natures, by dealing with the cause of this brokenness, which is our sin. Jesus didn't come to deal with religious people. Jesus didn't come to call good people. Jesus didn't come to deal with those who have the right family tree. I mean, remember his from Matthew 1. The right skin colour, the right education, the right employment history, the best behaved kids. Jesus came to deal with sinners, which is humans, which is every person, which is you and me. And he came to heal us of that sickness that has broken us and broken every fibre of this creation. Do you know that Jesus? Even more than this, do you know that you need that Jesus? If you are a human being, you are in desperate need of Jesus. You have the sickness of sin. You don't need a face mask. You don't need social distancing. You don't need a vaccine from a human laboratory. You need Jesus. You need the doctor who deals with the very thing that has made you broken, 
that has broken this world, regardless of how good, educated, employed, dysfunctional, bad, old or young you are, you need Jesus if you are a human being. How Jesus does this, dealing with sin, is gradually revealed until the climax at the end of Matthew's Gospel. But this much is clear. We are sick. We need a doctor. And Jesus is the doctor we need for our sickness, which is sin. Do you know this Jesus? Now, in that sense, I'm asking it again because I want to speak to those who have come to Jesus who have had their sins dealt with like Matthew, been made aright like Matthew. If you know this Jesus, then his command to Matthew, follow me, is present. It applies to you. When we follow Jesus, we follow Jesus. We don't need a second opinion. We don't need to submit his authority and his expertise to a Google search or Wikipedia to find out if there's an alternative. We don't need to look to our scepticism to see if we can find another way. When you follow Jesus, he sets the agenda because he is the doctor who has dealt with your sickness. Matthew displays this as he held his banquet. He invited the sinners to come and meet this man. Do you know Jesus? Well, if you do, then you share his desire, his concern, his focus. Mercy for the sinner, which means mercy for anyone. Do you know Jesus? Is your heart like his? A heart that yearns for mercy for the sinner. Or has it atrophied into a desire for goodness and the right behaviour and the right family tree and the right skin colour and the right employment record and the right friendship network before you offer Jesus? This Jesus, Jesus as he really is, I'm at point four on the outline, can sometimes be hard to grasp even fit into our understanding of the world. Now, that's nothing new. Look at verse 14. Then John's disciples came to him saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? The followers of John the Baptist, the Pharisees, look at Jesus and they scratch their heads. They ask, how does this bloke fit into our established ways of doing religion? They pick one of the acts of righteousness that Jesus dealt with in Matthew 6. Jesus' words there and in Matthew 5.20 need to caution us in the way we think about what he's about to say. Look at what he says there in verses 15 and following. Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests be sad while the groom is with them? The days will come when the groom will be taken away from them and then they will fast. No one patches an old garment with unshrunk cloth because the patch pulls away from the garment and makes the tear worse. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the skins burst and the wine spills out. The skins are ruined, but they put new wine into fresh wineskins and both are preserved. Given what Jesus has just preached and taught in the Sermon on the Mount, we must make sure that we understand what he is not saying here. He's not saying that he's come with a brand new religion, a brand new way of relating to God. Nor has he come to do away with religion. Nor has he come to establish an opposition between him and the Old Testament and the way the Jews did stuff. So what is he saying? Well, he uses three images there, doesn't he? Three images that all work together. But the key is the first image. Fasting was something that God's people were commanded to do once a year. When they gathered on the Day of Atonement as God's mob to confess their sin, it was a statement of sorrowful dependence upon God, a statement of mourning at the way humans were and are, a cry for God to do exactly as he promised to do once and for all we sin through Abraham's family. It was a right religious act that displayed a dependence upon God to do as he promised to deal with sin. So I think Jesus is stating here 
Why would you fast when what you hoped for, what you desired, what God had promised has come into your presence? That's the way weddings work, don't they? When the day comes, all the waiting is over. Throw yourself into it. Enjoy the time of fulfillment. Jesus is here. The moment God had promised has come. Why would you fast when that moment has come? Now, there are a lot of things going on here. You could preach a number of sermons on these verses dealing with all sorts of levels. But put simply, I think Jesus is saying at least this, just as he did back in Matthew chapter 6, get your religion and the religious deeds that rightly go with it, get it in the right context. Moreover, it's bigger than anything these humans have created based on what they understand God's word to say. I think that's where he's going in those images of the clothes and the wine. Uh, Leon Morris, a, a, a man who's written a terrific commentary on Matthew's gospel, Leon Morris puts it most clearly. He says, Jesus is not repudiating scripture, what God has revealed in the Old Testament. Jesus is repudiating the current religious practices allegedly based on Scripture. In that sense, Jesus is not here to conform to the religious constructions of humans. What God had promised, what God had prepared for, what God said was coming, it is here. The descendant of Abraham who had rolled back sin, he is here. The doctor is in the house. What a day. That's the right context for understanding your religious behaviour. It means that all those religious acts which pointed to the day of Jesus coming need to be understood in the light of the doctor having come to deal with our sickness. Do you know this Jesus? If you don't, then please come and know him. There is no other person who will deal with the cause of your brokenness, your sin. If you do know Jesus, then please listen to what he is saying here. Rejoice. The doctor is in the house. You are made whole by what Jesus has come to live, die and rise for. You are set aright inside and outside. Rejoice and live your religious deeds in light of him. Understand the context and do your religion in light of it as you wait for your father to bring that king back and enthrone him for all time in that wonderful consummation that we heard about last week. Please do a Matthew. Please introduce sinners to Jesus. By that I mean please introduce any human being to Jesus and introduce him as he truly is, not wrapped up in wrongly understood religious practice. Please introduce sinners to Jesus because the doctor is in the house. Let me pray. Dear Father, we give you thanks that you know our sickness, that you've committed to dealing with it, that you've sent the doctor. Father, if we don't know Jesus, please bring us to know him, to trust him, to take him at his word and live like it, to be connected to him so that we are set aright. Father, if we do know Jesus, give us hearts that desire mercy for all sinners. Give us a right understanding of the context for our religious acts and help us to introduce Jesus to sinners as he truly is. Amen.